So we have a, a great session to start off our, our afternoon. Uh, long been overdue, long been denied in orthopedics and medicine in general. Has had some push recently in regards to inclusivity uh, in medicine, let alone orthopedics. And we have a, an outstanding moderator today, Dr. Tony McLaurin, who is going to be our moderator for the session. And she's going to introduce our panelists uh, for this, uh, this great talk for the next 45 minutes. Dr. McLaurin. So I'm Tony McLaurin. As was mentioned, I'm going to be talking about inclusivity. This is mainly going to be a panel, but I just wanted to start out um, just giving you guys some information about, uh, you know, what's going on in orthopedics. Um, and I guess we say, why can't we move the needle? And also to show you that we really have not moved the needle at all since the beginning. So I'm very happy to be joined, uh, by, my, uh, joined by my panel here. Dr. Henry Boateng, Tunedye Wachiku, and Kamali Thompson. And uh, we, I'll give them more opportunity to talk about themselves as we get into this. Uh, but just wanted to start out with uh, talking about orthopedic surgery. Why are we having this conversation about orthopedic surgery? We have the lowest percentage of women in all surgical subspecialties, and one of the least diverse specialties in medicine. So two things not to be proud of. Uh, why does this matter? So if you look at the 2020 U.S. Census, so these are our numbers right here. And if you look at the most recent data from the uh, Academy's orthopedic practice in the U.S. survey, for some reason the 2020 numbers aren't available, but 2018, um, if you compare the percentage of Caucasians to the country, more significantly you compare the, number, the percentage of females in orthopedics. So these are uh, members of the Academy. So these are people who are done with training, are board certified, uh, orthopedic surgeons, 1.9% uh, black, 2.2% Latinx, and 6.7% Asian. So technically Asians are not considered underrepresented minorities in medicine because their representation is greater than it is in the population. However, that doesn't mean that there are not issues with inclusivity that involve them as well. So what about women first? The numbers are flat. If you look at these numbers, if you look at 2008, 2018, 4.1% to 5.8%. It's not very impressive. It does improve with younger members. So you guys are probably in residency programs and you're looking and you're saying, well, we have a lot of women in our residency program. These numbers don't track. So it's better for women under 40. It's about 16%. Something happens between people finishing training and becoming members of the academy. And we don't know what it is, but the numbers really drop off. The numbers have been the same, as you saw, for 10 years. They should be going up, but they're not. And the board will not release gender data. So we don't actually know what's going on in terms of, uh, you know, people, like pass rates, that sort of stuff. That information is not available. Uh, what about underrepresented in medicine? Same thing, 2008 to 2018. And if you look at all of these numbers, they're basically stagnant. So that's 10 years right there. Again, as you might imagine, slightly better in younger members, um, again, under 40. But even there, the main change has actually been in uh, Asian Americans and not so much any of the other uh, underrepresented groups. Oh, whoops, sorry. Got a little ahead of myself there. Yeah, something happened here. <laughs> OK. so. As is true in so many things, women are better. So women are actually, women in orthopedics are actually more diverse than men in orthopedics. But our N is obviously much smaller. Um, and also, there are more younger women in orthopedics compared to you know, the percentage of older women. So that's sort of why the numbers are like that. Um, and so what about inclusion? So we already know we're not diverse. What about being inclusive? So I'm sure everyone's heard about Speak Up Ortho. Um, and I'm sure everyone also heard about the Google Docs uh, or the Excel spreadsheet that was out last year um, where the incoming, so these are applicants, and these people are not even orthopedic surgeons yet, were making some really unbelievably misogynistic comments um, about people. And so this is what we are recruiting right now, so obviously not very inclusive. Um, these are some of the things, if you look at Speak Up Ortho, if you just read a few pages of it, it's mind-blowing, some of the stuff you read. And it's also for me, you know, I've been doing this like 8 million years, 
So it's kind of disappointing because things haven't changed since like the early 90s. I mean, yes, of course, things have changed. But the fact that this sort of stuff still continues to happen. So here's a faculty member who drunkenly offered his hotel key to a married woman resident. This was well known that he did this. She never said anything because she was afraid of the outcome. He's still in the department. Nothing happened to him. Everyone is just sort of like their dirty little secret. Or this one here, male chief resident told him to stand at the head of the bed, came up, put his arms around me while unnecessarily touching my breast to quote unquote, show me how to put a halo on. After I quickly extricated myself, I found him joking with the guys at drinks that night about how she's going to be single forever with an attitude like that. So these, these are our colleagues. This month, actually, uh, Speak Up Ortho has teamed up with Pride Ortho, which is a new orthopedic organization for the LGBTQ plus community within orthopedics um, that just was just started in, uh, I think, December of this past year. And so this month on Speak Up Ortho, they're actually featuring stories, not from women necessarily, but from LGBTQ orthopedic surgeons. And so here's a Pete's fellowship interview. Older attending said to me, I want you to know that our fellowship is not designed for your kind of people. I'm just being honest and don't want you to take it the wrong way. I'm not sure what the right way is to take that, um, but that's, that's what people are hearing. When I was a young attending, my boss helped me do a case at the end. He said, let's talk to that fag, you know, the foot and ankle guy. I told him we don't say words like that anymore, and that wasn't funny. And this is obviously an older person in orthopedics, because I said years ago I would have brushed that off, but now have become more outspoken. But obviously, if this is said to a trainee, they're not going to say anything about that. And then uh, at happy hour for work, I dropped something, bent over to pick it up, my pants ripped. I laughed about it, and one of the attendings asked to see. I turned around, he reached down and ripped my pants apart and said, this is what happens to, and I'm sure we can all fill in the asterisk between the F and the T there. So this is clearly not inclusive language. And this isn't just happening at the resident level. This was actually a really interesting uh, article that's just recently come out. Perception of racial and intersectional discrimination in the workplace is high among black orthopedic surgeons. So intersectional is like me, I'm intersectional. I'm a woman, so I'm underrepresented in orthopedics as a woman. I'm also black, so I'm underrepresented in orthopedics in that way too. So people who are in two underrepresented groups are considered intersectional. So when I first saw this, and we all feel the same way about surveys, it's like, oh, survey, 274 people, big deal. Uh, you know, that's nothing. And that was my first response, <laughs> because I was like, I know a lot of black orthopedic surgeons. So, you know, 274, that they didn't get a good response rate. And then I started reading it. So there are approximately 573 practicing black orthopedic surgeons in the United States, which is just an unbelievably low number. But the math works, 1.9% of our membership. So um, this actually was a 50% is actually a pretty good response rate for a survey. Um, but more damning was actually the results of this. So it really showed that uh, the extent of a discrimination experienced by black surgeons and showed that it's actually for everything that every black surgeon said that they experienced that was you know, some sort of workplace harassment or microaggressions or whatever, it was worse for black women. So clearly, you know, our, our specialty is not making people feel to be a part of the community. So we always talk about diversity. We also have to couple this with equity and inclusion. And inclusion is engaging diverse members in a manner that fosters an integrative and embracing culture. So no one should be, no one should feel othered by the, or the group that they're in. The environment needs to be conducive to this. So this is what we need to be talking about is not just diversity. And so diversity is when you invite someone to a dance. Inclusion is when you actually ask the person to dance once he or she arrives. And I saw this quote, which I thought was great. And this fits along with some of the examples I showed, uh, talked about earlier. What you permit, you promote. So we need to be careful about things that are said around us that we just sort of laugh off or you know, join in you know, with the back slapping and all that sort of stuff because we are part of the problem. And so we need to recognize you know, what, what is it that needs to happen amongst us to make all of us feel like we're all part of the same orthopedic community. Um, and so I'm gonna start this out um, just talking about uh, our panel. I'm gonna have uh, each person, person go down the road and introduce themselves. 
and say, uh, you know, say where they're from and that sort of thing. And I also, I put on here what's in a name. And I did that on purpose because if you look at the names on this panel, they may be names that are unfamiliar to you that you may have difficulty pronouncing. That does not give you license to consciously and repeatedly mispronounce them. So this is an important thing, and I want to start out with uh, Dr. Boateng here, and uh, just talk to me a little bit about, well, first of all, introduce yourself. Talk about your name, and any various pronunciations of your name, and how you sort of deal with, with this when people are talking to you. Thank you, Dr. McLaurin. Uh, my name is Henry Boateng. I am uh, an associate professor of orthopedic trauma at uh, Hershey Medical Center. I've been there, I guess, for about 10 or 12 years, um, actually 12 years, and uh, um, had the pleasure of working with a lot of you guys in the audience, so good to see you guys. I, uh, my name is pronounced Boateng. It is actually um, uh, Ghanaian in origin, uh, and so it's always surprising because everyone knows me as uh, Henry Boateng, but that is the, uh, which is I guess it's become fine. Uh, it's just the easiest of the malpronunciations <laughs> uh, that uh, I've gotten over the years. And so I guess in some regards, it's the uh, lesser of two evils. My, my wife, who is uh, Boateng for only 10 years, continues to fight the good fight. Every time uh, <laughs> someone says Boateng, she'll say Boateng. And she tells our daughter, don't let people call you uh, Boateng, it's Boateng. But you know, it's, uh, <laughs> and so she's new to the fight and so she continues on. Uh, but it's just been the easiest of the non-pronunciation. Not necessarily make it right, but it's a lot better than some of the others I've heard over the years. So that is why. All right. yeah. Dr. Lachuk. Yes. So <laughs> <laughs> my name is, if my mama were to say, it would be like Chinenya Wachuku. And then I came, then it was Chinenya Wachuku. No, take it back. Then it was Chinenye Nuachuku. Then Martin came with a show. Then it became Shanene Wachuku. <laughs> and, you know, it was one of those things where I think there was a certain time in my life where it was kind of annoying, right? It's like, I came back from Nigeria. Here I am, you know, I'm used to speaking English and my accent. And I come over here and I can't understand what anybody's saying. But they're speaking English too. And... Every time you try to correct it, it just never sounds like your mama says it. And it got to a point where, you know, you started having nicknames and everything. I became, you know, Wachuki now to my patients. You know, some people thought I was Japanese before they met me, before they had, you know, the internet because of my name, right? So it's become one of those icebreakers now. So I know I have a lot of names. I have Nay. People call me Dr. Nay. Patients will ask me, you know, what they call you for short. And... It's okay, actually. There was a point where I've been annoyed. It's mess, but it's almost like now, you know, it's like, well, how do you pronounce it? Take out the N. N is silent. Now they know something about me, right? They know something about, you know, how people in my language will probably pronounce my name. If they see somebody else, they'll probably say, oh, I know somebody who starts with mm, and they don't say the N. Is that the same with you? So, again, it kind of perpetuates this conversation that's actually educational and actually kind of friendly because you actually get to break the ice with the person. So for me, my name has been one of those, it's very helpful, but you know, I have so many variations now. It's just like one of those things where I try to see how many variations of my name I can get at the end of the week. So that's my thing. <laughs> Dr. Thompson. Hi everyone, my name is Kamali Thompson. I am a resident here at Temple I'm from New Jersey. And uh, you would think Kamali is like pretty, pretty easy to pronounce and some people get it like very immediately and some people it's like Camila, Cam Camille, uh, Kamala because when the vice president was elected everyone got confused. They're just like I don't know is it Kamala or is it Kamala? It's Kamali. So for me I used to when I was younger get really insecure about correcting people. I just didn't feel like it was my place and now just I feel like it's not that difficult so we're gonna get to the bottom of this. So normally I will just say my name a couple of times and then if people are really struggling with it then I'll just say Tamali with a K and then that seems to click. So that's the trick I use. So I think it was interesting. I was having this conversation with one of my fellow residents. And so if you guys are wondering that, yes, my first name is Tony, so no big deal. Um, although people, for whatever reason, always think it's Lori. 
Um, I think they can't wrap their brain around the androgyny of it. But um, people cannot pronounce my last name, which is the most ludicrous thing to me because it looks like the girl's name, Lauren, with an I instead of an E. And you just put a Mick in front of it. How hard is that? You'd be amazed. So I'm constantly called the wrong thing. And so I've always been very sensitive to pronouncing people's names correctly. And I cannot believe how many people just don't seem to care. So I was having a conversation with one of the residents about it who has a last name that is frequently mispronounced. And she was like, oh, you know, I, I don't really care. I just sort of given up. But she had a relatively simple first name. And so I think, you know, it's, a lot of times people, it's the first name is a bigger issue in terms of pronunciation. And it's really, you know, it's one thing if you can't pronounce someone's first name, that's fine. Ask them, try it, you know, and if you, if it takes you a few tries to do it, that's great. Keep trying. It's not okay to just, you know, decide that you're going to call them, you know, oh, well, I'll just call you Sam. That's easier. You know, it's not up to you what people are called. And you don't get to ask people, oh, isn't there some shorter thing that I can call you? What people introduce themselves to you is how they want to be called. And, you know, as we saw in the last um, election, you know, with uh, Kamala Harris, it actually got kind of weaponized to intentionally mispronounce somebody's name. The whole point of this, if you're wondering, why are we talking about names and inclusivity? It's re that's really not inclusive language. If you, Because, uh, again, you're othering people. If you refuse to pronounce someone's name correctly or even make the effort to pronounce someone's name correctly, you are disrespecting who they are where, where they're from, what their parents wanted when they named them, any given number of things. And, you know, inclusivity, a lot of it is just about respect. What do you guys have any other thoughts on that? Or? Well, you know, um, I think it's one of those things where if you see something that's foreign or different, I don't care who you are, you're going to react to it because it's foreign, it's different. If you're used to taking the same path to school every day, you're going to keep doing it. It's normal to you. You won't think twice about it. But if something blocks that road, then you kind of fluster. And I think what happens is sometimes when people meet somebody with an interesting name, interesting because it's foreign to them, the trigger is, well, what do they call you for short? You know, or is there something else we can call you? And it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's really a defense mechanism. So I definitely get it. But I think... Is one of those situations where now you have to make sure that you use that for good, right? You can be upset about it, but, I mean, if somebody can't pronounce Wachuku, you can't be mad at them. It's not part of the English dictionary, right? But at the same time, though, it gives you an opportunity to at least just reach out to the patient. And granted, we have a 15-minute um, patient visit. Those two minutes of you meeting that person actually gives you a chance to know who they are, they get to know who you are, and that relationship get, just kind of gets built from there. So that's how I kind of take it. Again, maybe I'm just older now, but I think probably the more positive way to kind of look at something like that. I think um, it's inter it's interesting, uh, just kind of what's in a name. It's uh, Some of it is obviously, most of it ends up being cultural. I've, over the past several years, I've had the opportunity to uh, go uh, to Ghana to do medical mission work, which is where uh, the origin of my last name is. And so I've had the opportunity to take uh, several colleagues along with me. And so we all get to the airport and they'll meet us at the airport. And like, you know, the people who work, uh, you know, people working at the hospital work and say, hello, Dr. Boateng, welcome back to Ghana. And all the colleagues I go with, they're like, wait, who, you, who are you talking to? That's Henry Boateng. And then they find out that I've been apparently deceiving them for years and they are upset. <laughs> and so, I mean, I, 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 again, I, I get it. It can be a, a little bit different, uh, difficult, um, but it's just the difficulty in, in taking the time to learn the pronunciation. And, you know, I think also, you know, I think as uh, Jianye can uh, attest to, it always does get a little tiring to continue to correct. And so, again, he's, I, for me, I've set around what's the least offensive to me. <laughs> I think the key with um, this topic and kind of the entire DE&I topic is recognizing unconscious biases. 
So everyone has them, uh, you know, and what everyone was saying earlier about recognizing something foreign is if you are putting yourself in a position to make things easier for you and more uncomfortable for other people, that is when you should be checking if there is an unconscious bias and how do I make that person feel more inclusive, even if it means putting myself, giving myself a little extra work trying to get the name correct. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. And, you know, sometimes you have to be uncomfortable and if if you know showing some doing something that's respectful to the other person makes you a little bit uncomfortable and trying to figure out how to do it the right way that's okay you're learning when you're doing that um so that sort of leads me a little bit into the next thing that i wanted to talk about um is the importance of uh mentoring and improving inclusivity because what comes up a lot is that people say, and you know, one of the big issues, and that's always considered a barrier um, in getting more women and underrepresented minorities into orthopedics, people say, well, you know, I, there just aren't that many mentors I can choose from. Um, but people need, you know, so you don't, your mentor does not need to look like you. And in fact, in orthopedics, your mentor is rarely going to look like you if you look like any of us here on the stage. Um, so I just wanted each of you to say a little bit about you know, the importance of mentoring and your thoughts about, you know, types of mentors you have and how you, uh, you know, how you feel about mentors that maybe are, you know, different types of mentors, I guess. I think, uh, I think you, you've said it well, and I mean, I think the statistics kind of, uh, you know, prove the point. And obviously, you're not always going to get a mentor uh, who looks like you. And I think, uh, in some regards, it may be difficult to see yourself in the person who's going to mentor you or the person you're menteeing. Um, I've had some fantastic uh, mentors over the years. Some of them are in the audience. Marcus Shadini, uh, Spence Reed, there's, these guys have uh, all mentored me over the years. They, despite what uh, Dr. Shadini thinks, he looks nothing like me. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, but at the same point in time, I mean, his mentorship is much appreciated and it's, you know, so I, for me personally, I think what's, you know, it's, I, I'm open and welcome. I think almost anyone who's underrepresented minority is open and welcoming to a mentor of, of you know, any ethnicity. Uh, but what I find interesting is as a, you know, I'm currently a mentor to a lot of people. And like, you know, again, there's not a whole lot of African-Americans or blacks in our residency, but I'm much so open to anyone. I enjoy mentoring everyone. And actually I learned a little bit about where they're from. And so I'm hoping that as also, as we become mentors, we're also taking in and learning from our mentees, because that's important. Um, again, I, I think I'd just be echoing the same things that you've been saying, just with different names. I mean, the reason there's a keynote speaker today, um, basically spoke about, you know, the title was William G. DeLong, right? So again, he was somebody that said, hey, you know what, let me give this dude a chance. Let me see what he can do. Right. And then afterwards said, you know what, I've worked with you for a year. I think I could stomach you. Let me bring you over where I am so that you can work with me actually as a partner. Right. I think that's important. You know, John R. Denton. I'm saying these names because the play John R. Denton is a person that was basically instrumental for me being an orthopedic surgeon. I didn't get in the first time I tried to get into orthopedics. So that hurt, but there was somebody that was literally saying, hey, call me, make sure that you keep up with me. And the next time I actually got in, right? I was the first black orthopedic resident in that program. Again, the program is defunct now, but for the years that it was there, I was the first one. Again, somebody said, you know what? I'm gonna take a chance on you, right? That's why I'm here. So again, I think in different parts in life, I have women that are mentors that are not necessarily in medicine, but those are the things that kind of drive you to be the person that you are. So again, yes, they may not look like you. The reason why it's important to have people that look like you are, I think there's certain experiences that, you know, you can kind of relate to that can help so that people don't have to make the same mistake twice. Right. And I think that's very important. Um, there's no reason to go to a place where, you know, I, I always talk to my wife about this. If you're in a place that, you have cell phones now. You don't have to build landlines, right? You just jump the curve. And I think that's what the mentor is there for. You know, just kind of putting somebody in that position where they can just kind of get the answers before the questions come out, right? And I think that's important. So again, as far as I'm concerned, mentorship is important. Again, it comes in various forms, sex, everything else involved. 
So I think mentorship and more importantly, advocacy, like if you had to make a pie chart of how do we increase diversity in orthopedics, mentorship and advocacy are going to take up the large majority of the pie chart. So why is that exactly? Because there have been numerous, numerous studies that show that the USMLE, even though it's going past fail, we all know what's going to happen with sub two. Um, that is institu- that's systematically racist. We know that NBME and clerkship grades are systematically racist. And we know that both the things I just mentioned are what help you get into AOA, which means that that's systematically racist. And then um, there was actually a really good study that Dr. Poon did in 2009, I believe, that said even if there was a Hispanic and a African-American student at the same grades, they were more likely to have higher volunteer experiences and more publications, and they still match at a lower rate than Caucasian students, right? So at the end of the day, how are we going to push the needle forward? You need people in the rooms that are going to advocate for you and that are going to say, this person should be matched. Maybe the other people aren't as good. So I think advocacy is something that everyone should be involved in because Dr. McLaurin just showed us there are only 573 African-American orthopedic surgeons, right? So they can't be the only people that are screaming at the mountaintops for people that should be getting into surgery, orthopedic surgery, in residency or fellowship or even for professorship positions. So I think everyone kind of really has a responsibility to picking students who are in more need for mentorship and have a responsibility to advocate for them. And until we have that, we're going to be having the same conversation in 10 years with the same numbers. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, it's important, the important point of all of this is to make sure that people who are potentially mentors understand that you don't, you know, you can be an excellent mentor to someone who doesn't look like you, so you don't need to feel like if, you know, a black student or a woman or whatever comes to you that you're not the appropriate person to be their mentor. First of all, people can have multiple mentors, so they don't have to be someone who looks like them all the time. But also, you have something to offer that, you know, just because you may not have shared life experiences, you still have the ability to mentor people. So it's important for uh, people, you know, I don't want to vilify white men in orthopedics. There's still a place for you guys. But uh, it's important to, you know, know that, you can you're you're just as valuable to uh, you know helping with inclusivity and even more so and be just making people feel like it doesn't matter what I look like and then also making sure too that you don't lay too much of a burden on your female and underrepresented minority colleagues, um, which you know I like to refer to as the black tax or the diversity tax, where literally every single black student who comes through our program gets told, oh, you need to go talk to Dr. McLaurin or like most of the women, you need to go talk to Dr. McLaurin. Well, I can't talk to everybody. And you know, it's like, it doesn't have to, I don't have to be the person to tell people what they need to do to get into orthopedics. Other people can do that. So it's important to recognize that you can serve as a mentor to someone without looking like them. And I know this has especially become sort of fraught in the uh, hashtag me too uh, environment right now. And you need to be, you know, obviously aware of that, but it doesn't mean that you can't be a good mentor to people who do not necessarily look like you. Um, One other thing I also wanted to mention, aside from advocacy, is also sponsorship. This becomes a bigger issue as you get further on in your career, is that you need sponsors. You need not just people who mentor you, but people who will bring you along and put you on boards and put you on committees and bring you in as speakers, things like that. Um, And that's something that you need. And that's something that in orthopedics is only going to come basically from white men in orthopedics because those are the people who are in the leadership positions right now. So um, I think we need to also consider the importance of sponsors being intentional to help with the inclusivity. And it needs to get to the point where it's less intentional in terms of I need to change what things look like, but more so in terms of I know this person is qualified, let me bring them in. And so people need to start looking at all of us as a group as being equally qualified. We're all here as orthopedic surgeons, which means we all did pretty good to get here. So um, that's part of the the lack of the inclusion. And I'm sure all of you in different subspecialties, when you get the brochures about lectures that are going on or meetings that are happening, it is literally the same faculty for every single meeting. And so that clearly, that's not inclusive for anybody in orthopedics, not just underrepresented minorities or women. It's just always the same lower group of people. So I think we just need to sort of branch out beyond ourselves. 
Um, and just one last comment I, I want to make about the article you mentioned with Selena Poon. The title of that article was actually uh, Race But Not Gender is, uh, I can't remember the exact title, but it's a, that race but not gender is an independent factor for not getting into orthopedics. So if you were anything, being any race other than white negatively impacted your ability to match into orthopedics, which is very interesting. And apparently the, uh, she got that information uh, from the match and they're like trying to sue her to get the data back. And there's a whole lot of stuff that went on with this article getting published. But it's out there, the numbers are real, um, and so that's something that we need to be thinking about as well. Um, anything else? I mean, again, all that being said too, again, this is more informational also, and also to kind of get people to see how we feel from this standpoint as orthopedic surgeons who are underrepresented. But for the mentors, you gotta keep the mentees responsible too. And I, and I think that's one thing that we don't stress enough, like the mentors do this, mentors do that. But it's the mentee's job to actually make this relationship work. If the mentee's not calling the mentor, then what the hell are we doing, right? So again, for those mentors, you know, let them know that, you know? And I think one of the things that we do a lot of is assuming, right? If people don't know what their roles are, then they can't perform it, right? And that goes for anything. So I think, again, with that mentor-mentee relationship, just let the mentee know what you expect of them, right? And if they don't do it, I mean, that's on them, but at least you've given them what their role should be in this relationship. All right, I was gonna ask everyone to give an example of uh, where you truly appreciated someone who's act acting as an ally, but I think that actually already came out quite a bit, um, just in terms of talk, people talking about mentors and people who would help them out in their career. Um, I, I think Kamali you didn't say anything specific to that. If you have any, uh, I do, example. yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> so for for me, and I'm sure most women can relate to this. When you walk into a patient's room, right, there's like pretty high chance you're gonna think that you're not the doctor. So even though you expect that, it still is really annoying because you came into the room for a reason, and now I have to divert from that to talk about how I am the doctor and then they're like oh but you look so young and you're like it's this whole conversation you're like that's not what I'm here for so um, my example is I think my residents do a really really great job of when they're with me establishing that we are on equal foot um, and there have been times when I haven't even had to say anything they kind of just step right in and I'm sure that you guys don't even recognize how important that is but it's helpful because it's really hard to advocate for yourself all the time so when other people really like jump in they take the burden off your back it's it's amazing so thanks residents um, co-residents for helping with that but um, those little things and when we're talking about unconscious bias those little things help so much to people who uh, really feel the burden. So if you can keep doing that, that's one way can, to really even the playing field. I do want to say one thing too, um, to echo what you said. I think you can bring somebody in, but if you don't have the environment or the medium for that person to thrive, then it's all for naught, right? Because you're going to have those bad days. But if that person has somebody to lean on, then it makes it easier, right? So again, it's not just bringing people in, but also creating an environment where they can actually thrive. So I think that's very important also. Right, and that's, that's the inclusion piece of the whole thing. It's not just enough to change the numbers and to change the appearance, but you also need to make the people who are there changing those numbers feel like they belong and they're not just there to check off a box. Um, so I think that's incumbent on all of us to make sure that we're you know, dealing with people in a more inclusive way. Um, I know we got off to a little bit of a late start, but so I'm gonna skip over a couple of things I was uh, going to talk about. But the one thing I want to do is just sort of go down the panel and just have each person say one thing they can, you know, since the talk of this was how do we move the needle since we haven't managed to in 10 years, um, any thoughts on what we can do to move the needle and to uh, make things a little more diverse and inclusive in orthopedics? I think um, the first thing that we can do is it kind of begins with things that we're doing now, and that is the open dialogue, right? I mean, I think that these are uh, topics that we've historically kind of thought are like either A, not worth talking about, B, not important enough, or C, too uncomfortable to talk about, right? And so I think at some point in time, we all have to have that open discussion on being more diverse, on, on better inclusion, on how do we support, uh, you know, how do we support that endeavor? Um, I think the one thing that's also... Uh, 
um, I, I found challenging um, at my own institution at times is uh, when you are one of the very few uh, minorities at any place, I'm sure each of you have had that uh, experience as well, it can be pretty isolating. Right? It can be pretty isolating at times because not everyone's going to get your perspective. And that's okay because I don't get everyone's perspective either. either. But sometimes when you can't find anyone else who gets your perspective, that's pretty isolating. So it's just kind of uh, be, being able to have an open dialogue and being willing to go down, to have those conversations with people are important. I think that's one way to start beginning that. No, I agree. I, I mean, I think we have to be intentional. I, I think that starts at the res the residency director, chairman, hospital level, as far as who you want to bring into your program, gotta be intentional about it. I mean, it's all good to talk about it, get the numbers and say, we need more studies to figure out how to figure out more studies. Just say, this is what you want to do and then do it. But at the same time though, you need to have the system on board. Um, I think, you know, for example, for our, our hospital system, we have like an advocacy group um, that's basically inclusive of everybody, not just the doctors, but the residents, the students, the scrub techs, the nurses, a IT. Again, it doesn't have to be everybody that's a physician, but if you build some sort of community, then it works. Why am I saying that? If we can be intentional about who we're accepting so we can change the demographics and then making sure that you're um, improving on that by making sure you build a community that the system is really part of. Because the system is part of it, it's easy to get it done. It's harder to do when it's just a department trying to push these initiatives. So two actual items that I'm a big advocate for is one, encouragement. I feel like a lot of times if you don't look like the stereotypical ortho male resident applicant, people are very quick to tell you that you belong somewhere else. Like, oh, maybe you should think about peds or maybe if you want to operate OB, it's a place for you. Like, I'm sure if you spoke to a lot of female um, surgical candidates, they would say that someone tried to dissuade them from ortho or even gen surge and put them in a peds or OB. So I think on the other side, we should be encouraging more people to apply to ortho. So. There's a lot of students that we rotate with, and then sometimes I'll ask them to help me reduce something, and I'm like, have you thought about ortho? And they're like, oh, I've never really thought about it. So planting that seed and really encouraging more people that they do belong there, and if they like it, you don't have to own a tool set to apply for. <laughs> like, it's not on ERAS, you know what I mean? Like, how much can you bench and all that stuff? So really encouraging more people to get involved. And the second thing I would say at the medical school level is having – um, traveling scholarships for underrepresented and women applicants because we know that financial aid is often a barrier for some of these students. So in order to get more applicants to your program, if you provide money for them to come to their away rotation or even an interview, then I think that'll help increase the number of people that are applying and therefore increase, increasing the match rate. All right. Well, thank you all for those points. And I just want to get back to one of the things that uh, Dr. Boateng was saying about having the dialogue. And I must say that uh, with this starting after lunch, I was a little worried about uh, the attendance, attendance and that frequently things like this, you're preaching to the choir. The people who sit here and listen are the people who already are thinking about these things and already care about them. Um, not to say that anyone in here isn't that person, but, um, but I just wanted to say I was happy to see that people did come back in um, and did not decide to skip this session. So. I think that's that's a start. So that was a good thing to see. Um, so I think uh, that's about what we got. And I don't know if we have time for any a question or two or anything. Are there any questions? None at all. A little loud. <laughs> I I would just like to say some very powerful information and then eye opening. Uh, sitting back and, and watching some of the slides and some of the comments that were made. Uh, by others is shocking and embarrassing to know that it actually is said or still exists. Uh, I would like to uh, thank you all for your empathy, your class, and your restraint in doing what you do every single day. Uh, unless you sit in your shoes or wear your glasses, I don't think anyone understands what you go through on a daily basis. And to be empathetic towards those that are ignorant and hold space for them and express what you go through on a daily basis in doing it in a way that's intelligent and respectful uh, takes a lot of restraint. And I don't think anyone here understands that 
unless you've been through what you go through. I'm, I'm a first generation uh, in this country. My parents are immigrants. My father's from the Middle East. Uh, my last name is Kazanjan. Uh, yet I look white. I look Caucasian. I used to bench 360. I do have a toolbox at home. And even though I tell patients daily what my last name is and how proud I am of my name, I don't go through what you experience every day. Even though my heritage is different and no one knows what I've been through, I don't know what you go through. And I appreciate what you've done. And mentorship with people that you are not like or uncomfortable speaking to uh, should be recommended and we become we can we are the ones who can only move the needle and by mentoring someone that's not like you can be as gratifying to you as it can be to them and can give you the information to be better and I, I look for the day that inclusivity is truly what the word is supposed to be and I thank you all thanks I just want to say one quick thing after that just your comment about not knowing what you know we've all been through. Um, that's one key thing when you're talking to people. You know, it's never a pain contest. It's not, oh, well, yeah, I know exactly what that's like because I had X happen to me. No one in this room knows what my life was like as a woman in orthopedics, black woman in orthopedics 30 years ago. No matter what else is going on in your world, that wasn't your world. So if I'm saying something, take it at face value. It's not a contest. No one has to try to outdo, oh, well, I know what that's like because X. Just respect what other people have to say. And we respect that, you know, we've all had our life experiences, but everyone's had very different life experiences. And that's part of inclusivity, recognizing that we all come with different backgrounds, but we all are orthopedic surgeons. Thank you very much. Thank you.